We now uh, hear the last talk of the conference given by Boris Shapira. Uh, Boris is a web professional who is interested in uh, web performance and more broadly in all aspects of web quality. Uh, he is the husband of a dragonfly and the father of two hobbits. And he is currently customer success manager at Content Square, uh, recently acquired, uh, that recently acquired uh, their boost. And uh, last but not least, I think he's one of the nicest person I've ever, ever met. So please go ahead, Boris, and go for your talks. Hi, everybody. My name is Boris Shapira, and I'm very happy to be here to talk about web performance, of course, but mostly about how we can create a concrete utopia in our project organization. Um, I really like being here because uh, I participated into the creation of Wheel of Speed in 2018 and I co-organized the 2019 edition that you can see right there. Um, what I like about Wheel of Speed is that we made the event uh, accessible for all types of audiences. People who just get into performance and people who have been doing it for a long time. But a lot of the talks focus on the same thing, technical skills. And I wanted to propose a small parenthesis, a moment to step back from tech skills and imagine what would be an ideal work organization for us. What would be our concrete utopia and why? First of all, let me start by explaining what a utopia is. Um, I could, in order to talk about utopias, talk about the Utopia Island, a political organization that gave its name to the concept imagined by Thomas More. But Utopia is neither the first Utopia imagined, Atlantis, for example, precedes it, nor the last, nor the most accomplished if one can evaluate the achievement of a Utopia. Instead, I will introduce you to Ernst Bloch, a 20th century German Jewish philosopher. He wrote a great book called The Principle of Hope, uh, in which he questions the profound nature of Utopias. He noted their presence in art, literature, religion, and many other forms of cultural expressions throughout all eras. For him, the elaboration of utopias is a human necessity. Bloch defines utopia as the realistic anticipation of what's good. Realistic because it's built on a constant dialogue between, on one hand, uh, the analysis of reality, and on the other hand, the opposition to this reality. Anticipation, because utopia is constantly renewed, uh, a, a constantly renewed fictional future. Um, it's never achieved. And the last thing we need to define is what is good. And for that, we're going to use the moral philosophy tool set. Uh, what would good be for us in web performance? And by extension, what would be bad? Um, I've looked around a bit and I tried to remember my past experiences and over the years, I found a lot of projects that went well or not at all. Uh, I will not give specific details about it because I want to preserve the people that participated in it. So I created a little narrative, that, but everything I'm going to explain there, uh, I've experienced it. To introduce this story, I'm going to need a professor of moral philosophy that some of you know. Here he is. On the left, it's Chidi Anagonie. Chidi Anagonie is one of the characters from the TV, TV show The Good Place, a very fun and instructive TV show. For those who have seen it, you should see some analogies in this talk, and for the others, don't worry, uh, but if you can, in the future, just check it out because it's really good. Um, in our narrative, Chidi will not be a professor of moral philosophy, he will be an expert in web performance, and he will be our reference in the field. He will be helping Eleanor, Eleanor is an e-commerce manager with a big technical and functional depth. And let's be honest, since she's on the job, she's never done anything to improve performance. And most of the, most of the time, uh, she is very satisfied with the situation. Except today, because after a performance ranking published on a famous website, she realizes that her e-commerce needs a lot of optimization. One problem though, her superior don't know about it, and she'd rather keep it a secret to avoid losing her job, aka being sent to the bad place. So she asked Chidi for help with the little budget she has left each month. 
After a quick audit of the damage, Chidi understands that he won't be able to perform miracles. Eleanor was not interested in performance before and has developed many psychological mechanisms that prevents her from talking about it seriously. Chidi has a lot of coaching to do and together they're going to improve the website. That's, that leads us to item number one of my dream organization uh, around web performance. Never go solo on a web performance project. People who try often face a lot of issues. So make sure you have at least one stakeholder in the company, not like Eleanor. And if you don't, uh, just make sure that you have a whole team backing you up. To demonstrate the magnitude of the problem, Chidi starts with a consequentialist approach. Consequentialism is when action is considered good or bad, depending on, on its consequence. Um, in theory, it's a good way to rate Eleanor's investment in web performance. In practice, it's a little more complicated than that. For example, Eleanor did some research before contacting GD, and she tested several lab testing services and tried to implement a piece of advice that she failed was within her range, optimizing images. She spent several hours on it, and at the end of the operation, she ran tests again, and the score had not changed, or only slightly. And she didn't notice any gain on the business side. That's the issue with consequentialism. To score points, your action must have results. You can be lucky, or you can be well-informed, or you can find a quick win, but in most cases, uh, if you try to improve things um, out, of the, out of the blue, on the small scales, you're going to have very little impact. So item number two of my Utopian web performance project, being able to give impactful insights first. Another issue with lab testing score-based approach, and if you do only this, is volatility. Sometimes the scores address the structure of the page itself and are therefore very stable over time, but poorly reflects the page speed. Other time, it's exactly the opposite with a score that aggregates the performance data, but as a result is very volatile. Finally, the score are only applied to the tested pages under the tested conditions. They are not able to tell which type of page is problematic, in which situation and for whom. All this prevents Eleanor from measuring business impacts. Eleanor is not at all reassured by this approach and she already imagines her superior in seeing the scores and sending them to the bad place. Chidi reassures her and explains that these scores are in perfect projection, but most are coming from the same fundamentals. Fundamentals that are born out of years of discussions among web performance professionals, and together they will focus on doing better step by step by focusing on this corpus of principles to be followed. Chidi calls it a deontology, a set of rules that defines the good and the bad in terms of web performance for us, of course. This is a capture of the excellent front-end performance checklist by Vitaly Friedman, uh, published each year on Smashing Magazine. Vitaly lists many best practices that are key to our deontology, and they represent the way many people uh, perceive web performance today. When we say, I learn web performance, in fact, we often heard this way with these ways of implementing websites. All these best practices evolve regularly because they are always the result of a constant dialogue between on one hand reality, aka the observation of the way browsers and frameworks work, leading to the emergence of optimization, and, the, and on the other end, the opposition to reality, aka by rolling out code or design innovations, that improve user experience or enable better observation. Our deontology, our best practices, but we're going to call this our deontology, is very fragile. Some stakeholders may want to own it through innovation aimed at integrating some of the best practices into a new framework in order to make this framework a de, fa de facto standard. Uh, AMP, I'm thinking about you or by working on the governance of some projects to guide the best practices in a way that suits them. This is an issue that Eleanor has already encountered on previous projects where developers clung to practices and metrics that meant nothing for her. 
And that's one of the reasons that she didn't do any more efforts after that. So item number three of my dream web performance organization, um, not to be able to create the perfect pool because we won't be able to, but to be able to aggregate several deontologies, several source of truth to create some kind of consensus. So Eliana goes through the performance checklist and she sees a recommendation for using HTTP2 or above. This time, unlike the image optimization, the recommendations comes with a promise. By switching to a modern version of HTTP, the fetching of the resources needed by the page will start more quickly. Quite often, it's presented like that, and we can see that all the resources are loaded very quickly in the waterfall. This is a classic best practice that should improve the situation, but immediately after implementation turns out to degrade performance because all the resources are competing over the network. Each resource has a very low attributed bandwidth and therefore takes forever to download. So in reality, when you implement it, things look like this. On a page that loads sometimes 50 or 100 resources from the main origins, this is very annoying. So Eleanor once again is disappointed. She feels like she's failing in her optimization project, and actually she's not. She's just going through an intermediary phase. Eleanor will now be assisted in prioritizing resources and rebuilding an efficient waterfall. Step four of my web performance utopia, optimization should be perceived as projects with several milestones and be tracked over time. You can say we're going to do this and this, go this is going to improve things because sometimes it's not. And Chidi in this situation is very uncomfortable because he knows that the optimization will be good in the long run. He knows that it is necessary to do it right now to lay the foundation for the future. But at the moment, it's degrading the performance and he can't resolve this internal conflict. He has stomach aches. He no, longer, he no longer knows how to motivate Eleanor, who is mostly interested in short-term commercial benefits. So he brings in a colleague from UX design who is used to this kind of challenge, and she explains to Eleanor that performance is an imperative with a variety of benefits. A high-performance website can provide faster access to important information, improve the image of the website or the brand, or improve the perception that some people may have of the future customer service. A high performance website can even contribute to make people happy because it releases dopamine. So it's good, in fact. And fast websites allow people of all types to access the web with the same quality of services. So it's also an ethical equality imperative. She says that phrase. She says you're not you're supposed to be good. Oh, sorry. She says you're supposed to do good thing because you're good and not because you're seeking moral desert. Uh, point five of my dream web path organization, um, being able to motivate people with that, that kind of uh, uh, that kind of thing, uh, motivate people with ethical um, positions. Elena continues her path toward uh, site website optimizations, and as soon as Chidi identifies an error for improvement, they discuss it and implement the necessary modifications. They release a lot of small projects, repeatedly and constantly. Eleanor gains an, an intuitive understanding of things that could improve performance, and she looks at new features with a fresh eye. As the saying goes, practice makes perfect. Um, Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, said that you don't have to be good to do good deeds, you just start doing them, even you can force yourself to do them, and that's the repetition of those good deeds that makes you a better person. Uh, we are what we repeatedly do, excellence then is not an act, but an, a habit. So a small addition to our item number five about uh, motivating uh, teams, I think ethics ever is a very good driver for not giving up. 
little by little, Eleanor find herself in the situation of the most mature team in web performance, those who have integrated the virtue ethics of Aristotle. And it pays off. Uh, Eleanor embraces web performance on a daily basis, and her e-commerce has improved to the point where she's no longer ashamed to report it regularly. Her team is able to take initiative as well, thanks to the lab testing, they are reactive, and they know how to use field data to plan and find contextual issues. Uh, after Gilles intervention, uh, Gilles was talking, I think, three talks before mine, um, Eleanor decided to integrate the net promoter score into her reporting, and thanks to the verbatim that is attached to customer feedback, she discovers that some customers were fin finding the add to cart feature to be too fast, leading to product products being added to the cart several times. Um, item six of our web performance project uh, never optimized without a confirmation of the quality by the UX team. Sometimes you need to slow things down for the experience to be improved. Um, by adding the tracking data into the mix, the team is able to quantify the number of people affected by this specific issue and the potential payoff, so the UX designer adds a small add to cart animation to improve the overall experience. After spending a lot of time in, on the landing pages and the add to cart, the team looks further into the conversion funnel and detects some performance issue coming from the API calls. There's bug in them. Uh, once again, it was the quantification of these issues that helped prior prioritize the resolution. So still on item number six about the UX, remember that you can evaluate the UX feedback with quantitative data also. Finally, uh, the issues that cannot be optimized because they're temporarily impossible to fix are recorded into a tech depth document uh, to be used in the case of a replatforming or a redesign. Please do this. Uh, log your web performance issues into a tech depth document. And when you're going uh, replatforming, don't forget web performance and don't do this on the last uh, sprint. That's my item number seven. We are at the end of this story, which summarizes some of my bad experiences in recent years, and I can fill my wish list with what I think would be a future perfect utopian web performance organization. Um, it comes from the observation of reality. Uh, it, it's built against this reality, and I use the toolset of moral philosophy to fuel it. First item, uh, the people in charge of web performance are often alone. We need to change that and we need to design a solutions that are made for teams. Second, we often push teams toward what they can do, like optimizing images, rather than what they should do, like burn all their non-critical JavaScript. Point three, um, no tool can be the absolute source of truth. A lab testing tool can't evaluate real user experience, a real user experience monitoring service is useless when you when you need to quickly eva evaluate some hypothesis you have, and none of these tools can cross-check performance with load issues or API calls bugging or anything like that. So we need better troubleshooting capabilities, and for that we need to be able to aggregate uh, information from different tools. Number four, I'll be frank, very, very little team manage their web performance like a project, with feature commitments on deliveries and planification, and I think we need to change this. Number five, we need to rely more on the user experience field. Web performance is often perceived as a developer issue, and that's not true. We can use quantitative UX to build a bridge between coding and the UX quality analysis. Number six, I've been doing web performance from nine years now, and I've met a lot of replatforming that were worst than the original platform. Um, when you redesign, when you're using a new solution, you need to priori prioritize uh, the user experience and the web performance of the project, or you'll lose all the benefits of every previous efforts you've made. That leaves me with the last issue to tackle, uh, how to motivate team during plateaus or when the web performance uh, regressed. And in my story, I mainly use ethics to motivate Eleanor, but I must say, People are not that motivated by ethics nowadays, and it's a shame. 
Uh, they want business results. Uh, many teams stop optimizing as soon as one of these plateau appends. So I must confess, I not always use ethics alone. I often use competitive analysis as a strong driver, convincing companies that they should persevere because their competitors do. But I'm not very proud of it, and maybe I will end in the bad place for this. So if you have any idea to push ethics forwards, contact me because I'm really interested. Thanks for listening to me. If you have question, ideas, suggestion, let's talk on the web, um, on the Wheel of Speed Slack, or on Zoom, or anything else. I'm open. I'm Boris Shapira. I'm not a guy. I'm web performance expert, customer success manager for Jabust and Content Square. Goodbye. Thank you, Boris. Thank you very much for uh, for this very interesting talk, and um, it's great to have you uh, uh, on stage after having you in the organization team. We are really happy for that. So um, let's go for uh, three or four questions. Um, first question from uh, Nicola. Uh, Nicola, who uh, <laughs> yes, that that, that <laughs> Nicola, who, who is asking, should a team try to implement your uh, utopia? Uh, which point would you have them focused on first? And the second part of the question is another way to put this: Are there dependencies between some of those points? Um, Really interesting question. Thanks, Nicolas. Um, I think the first first element and most important element is working as a team, transverse transversal communication uh, through the team. So I'd say the first point is important, and then everything will come easily because people are going to start talking, and issues will be tackled by a lot of different um, profiles with different skills. And I think that's what we need in web performance. Um, going outside of our technical skills and try to look at other people in the company. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, in the same, same area, uh, is a team dedicated to web performance a good idea or do you prefer a team in charge of uh, evangelizing the whole company? Um, I've put a, uh, sorry, I've participated in both. Um, when you are a member of a team that is purely dedicated to web performance and you're working on web performance alone, your team is the only team working on web performance, the other team um, tend to consider you uh, really bad because the only moment you see the CEO is when you come to be angry at them because the web performance of their feature is not good. So I don't think it's a good mix. And I'd rather organize my utop utopic organization with um, a specific tool for web performance, but champions in every other team to lead the way and leverage web performance into their own area. So maybe you can add one Stephanie Walter for UX design. Maybe you can have a uh, I don't know, Miriam helping the ACO team. Uh, you, you need to have someone everywhere to help you because if not, uh, you're against people and not with them. Okay, thank you. So next question and maybe the last. Uh, is web performance uh, an opportunity to introduce other quality topics like uh, say accessibility? Yeah, uh, I strongly I strongly think that it's the case. Uh, you can introduce a lot of other topics uh, through web quality. Performance is one of them. Accessibility is one of them. Web security is one of them. Um, you, you can really tackle a lot of different questions when you start by the user experience and user risk regarding uh, security. Uh, you can really tackle things that I don't think we are tackling enough today. Okay, thank you. So I don't think we have, um, you know, okay, no, no questions at all. So thank you very much, uh, Boris, and uh, really happy to have you uh, on stage. Uh, goodbye.
And uh, over to you, uh, Nicola, for uh, for a word, for some words on. Uh, uh, ah, do, do you want to say something, uh, Boris? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, over to you, Nico, for uh, the conclusion. Thank you very much, Boris.